Hello everybody, thank you so much for coming in and watching this video today. I have with me my wonderful friend Mike Ingram who has written some terrific books which he will tell you about in just a second. Um, today we're talking, we're going back to my equal love as the Tudors, we're talking about the Wars of the Roses and Richard III and Henry Tudor and a little bit about the Battle of Bosworth aren't we? So that's what we're looking at today um, and I know a lot of you know that I really really love this part of, of medieval history and um, we were saying as well just now before we came on that actually you can't separate the two periods really you need to understand what went on before is to really appreciate how the Tudors sort of operated and came in that was really really important so you need to know this stuff if you don't already yes so Mike before we get on to the nitty-gritty can you please tell us a little bit about you and what you do Okay, so um, say Mike Ingram, uh, I'm a historian. Uh, I prefer the medieval period and tend to stay in there, but I do drift from time to time. Um, I've also got a master's in World War II, so I dabble in World War II. Um, but one of the things that I, I found when I first started studying history is, is, as you've already said, you can't separate things out. So you have to study a lot more around it. Um, and I think more people should know that, which is why I also teach medieval history, uh, normally to adults, um, but I do take groups. I also do tours, um, whole variety of tours of different periods. Um, but again, medieval is my favourite and I, and I do medieval more than anything else. But I also do a civil war tour. Mm. Um, I'm a trustee of the, the Naseby project. Um, so we've the organisation has been involved in putting visitor platforms all around the battlefield and things like that. So I'm very much involved in the Civil War as well. Um, and then other things as well. Um, I'm very much involved in Northamptonshire's history. Um, and there is so much history in Northamptonshire that it's a never ending job. Yeah. Um, Eleanor crosses, uh, all sorts of things like that. So we, I was very much involved in saving the Eleanor Cross from falling down. You were, yes. Um, so I do that. And then we, that also takes you into other periods. Tudors, because it's got a county's got an interest in Tudor history and so on and so forth. So I teach all that. I do tours on that, including the gunpowder plot, because again, it's all Northamptonshire. And I write books. You do. Very, very good books. Thank so you. Show, show, show us your books. Okay, so this is the last one. This is the, the Bosworth one. And that has been exceptionally well received for good reason, hasn't it? Really? Yes. Has. Yeah, yeah, I'm very pleased with all that one. And then this is the new one I've written with a friend of mine, Graham Evans. Yep. Uh, this is on the battles and battlefields of Northamptonshire. So it includes everything from Saxons, Vikings, um, right through uh, the medieval period because there's two wars of the roses battlefields in northamptonshire uh, and then going on to all the stuff in the tudor period particularly with things like the depopulation and enclosures of the county uh, and the midland revolt and then going on to the civil war and naseby and so on and so forth and in fact you um, and you're doing some more articles for the tudor society as well aren't you but you've done some articles for the tudor society about some of those things as well yes so yeah so they'll be coming up soon yeah so if anybody is a member of the tudor society then you'll be able to read those fairly shortly um, yes um right okay so what we're going to start is a little bit talking about before we get to the Battle of Bosworth, really, because one of the things that you've really talked about in your book is historically really going back to look at Henry and Richard, who they were before it got to this point. Yes. Obviously, they um, had very different lives until they clashed, and they didn't actually physically clash until the big day, if you like. No, no. You know, their, their interactions were pretty much non-existent really but so i use the word relationship very loosely when i say to you what was their relationship if you like up until the point of inevitability um i think they were concerned but again i think you've got to look at this not just in the context of, of richard and henry but you have to go back beforehand to edward the fourth reign um Jasper Tudor was a clear threat to Edward mm. uh, and Edward tries to have him extra extradited 
uh, back in 1472, I think it was. Um, so there, there was there was a clear threat there from from an early period, and Henry, of course, is only a young boy, so he's he's not the the threat in question. But as they get older, um, Henry seems to become the more dominant one, and the more one that that actually is going to be an issue. Mm. Or, or they or Richard starts to perceive him as a threat. Whether he perceives him as a big threat or as a minor one, it's very difficult to say. There's not, not enough evidence to to support one way or the other. But of course, then Richard, once he's on the throne, he does at least make one attempt to try and extradite Henry. So he, he's he's clearly a threat of some description. But I it all sorry, sorry. Uh, you, you you again, you have to look at it as in the bigger picture of what's going on mm. in the whole of Europe at the time. And, and there had been so much sort of because of the wars of the Roses, there was always turmoil within, you know, like people vying for the crown. You know, it, people tend to look at it as the wars of the roses, but it had been going on forever, really, hadn't it? It wasn't just, yes, yeah. And I suppose any threat, however big or small, still needed to be taken seriously because it was be it did. foolish to ignore something, however insignificant it might seem. You know, you yes. take your eye off of, of the ball, and and that's fatal, isn't it? Yeah, e exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So we just talked a little bit about because that was going to be my next question was how serious did Richard see Henry's threat? And I suppose as it progressed, it became more notable. Yes. Something else you said just a minute ago made me think: how much of it was Richard and how much of it initially maybe was it other people whispering it in his ear some with good intentions and possibly some with bad intentions I think it's a mixture of both um, and, and because we, we, we mustn't forget that Henry was in Brittany for a long while mm, he was yeah um, over 14 years before it got to before we got to Bosworth um, and it's not until really later on that he does seem to what that it's coming in and we, it's not just the whispering in the ears it's also to do with um it, it's to do with the will of the people because we have accounts and there, there are there are bits and pieces that are said um because it's all connected with with a war with france mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as much as anything else um and the people, the people want want England to invade France again. So he he's also coming down to political pressure, as much as anything else. It was very fashionable, wasn't it, invading France in those days? Yeah, yeah. It was almost um, like a rite of passage. You had to invade France at some stage in the proceedings. If we go back to 1475 under Edward, Edward uh, invaded France. Uh, all the nobility joined in. But really, the, the Hundred Years' War, although it's generally thought of as it stopped beforehand, there was never a peace settlement actually signed between the two halves after the Battle of Castellon. Uh, and Edward was, particularly with the, uh, the political games that Louis, the King of France, was playing, um, and, and because there was a, an unofficial war still going on, there was lots of um, battles at sea that were taking place between pirates of English pirates. Whether they were state sanctioned is another thing. Um, so, so there's this going on and there are raids on, on fleets and that constantly going on all during this period. And, and even when Richard took the throne, they were still going on. Mm. Um, but if you go back to 1475, Edward invades France. Um, he was supposed to meet up with the Burgundians and it didn't happen for whatever reason, but um, the French bought, um, brought Edward off. Yes. And a lot of the senior nobles. And a lot of people in England uh, um, thought that was really shameful, including Richard. Mm. So, so that they wanted to, wanted to carry this war on. So again, it's all part of this this bigger picture, yeah. Which is which is from what we're saying that you have to look at the bigger thing. And and that's it. It's um. I spoke to Heather Darcy last week about Anna of Cleves and um 
and very much again you, you, we were saying just now as you say about the bigger picture but it isn't just the bigger picture within england it's very much all this intercontinental wars and politics and if people haven't seen that one go back and then it will make sense but um so one of the things you've spoken about at great length in your book and maybe hasn't been covered exceptionally well in the past is the french connection yes so please tell us a little bit about the french connection again we have to go back to 1475 really um to to this shameful piece that edward puts together and um, once richard takes the throne it's quite clear that he's intent to invade france again mm. france at the time uh, and initially um the french um the french were fairly well contained but there's also also a war going on with Brittany, and that's quite clear because this is where henry is yeah and he's being used as a bargaining tool mm -hmm. all this time um the french are not particularly interested in in henry at the start of the reign um because when he comes over to england as part of buckingham's rebellion um, the first time Henry, Henry tries to come to England. Um, first of all, on his way over, the fleet's broken up by storms, which presents problems. But then when he goes back to Brittany, he's also blown off course again and ends up in France. Mm -hmm. um, and the French don't want to know that all they do is escort him back into, back into Brittany again. So if they'd have wanted him at that time, that was the time to do it yeah yeah um so they didn't want to know it's not until really richard's on the throne you've got the duke of burgundy putting um an army together to invade france and also Brittany. and there's some very 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 slight hints that the spanish might have been involved but i haven't been able to find that data yet yet um yet. which which is another interesting story that comes on with Tudor stuff later on um, but what, what what's in happening so you've actually got a coalition of allied forces building against France mm. uh, and the French go through them and take them out one at a time wow. so so they go to Brittany first and take up Brittany then there's also the fight um, with Burgundy uh, and they temporarily stop the Burgundians uh, and then, of course, it's the English turn. So the way that they solve the, the English problem is that they start supporting Henry yes. and give Henry, give Henry a, an army to come over to England and invade. Um, Do you think that they seriously thought that he had a chance of success? Um, I know that's it, a really difficult question, isn't it? I just, it, it, just, it is. Um, they must have done at the time. But I think they didn't think he could do it on his own, mm. which is why they gave him 2,000 crack French troops. Yeah. Well, they were correct. He couldn't have done it on his own, could he? No. Um, absolutely. So, but, and I think, obviously, um, Richard's sister, hadn't she, um, had come to Brittany. Margaret? Yes. Uh, Margaret, Burgundy. Burgundy, yes. Burgundy. So yes. she had sort of a little bit of, of an interest in things as well hadn't she in, yes um, she, she was playing which is why henry called her the diabolical duchess yes <laughs> um after richard took over yeah but you know from her perspective and, and people can we haven't really we could talk about her another time maybe but um mm. today we, we don't have that sort of time but um she was a very shrewd woman and, and she knew what she wanted and what she did. oh they, they were all very she, sharp people yes and um, quite quite a strong and well respected and authoritative figure, really, for her time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah so, oh, so, so that's that's. I digress slightly. With that. <laughs> it's very easy to do. It's very easy to do in these discussions here. Now, in terms of talking about the French connection, obviously we've got a short amount of time here, and you know, you really need to go and get your teeth into that, don't you, in, in your book? Yes. Really. Yeah. And it, it was certainly something that um, I found I had to go through very carefully and work it through because it would be easy to miss something and not put all the connections together. 
So yeah. it's definitely something that's really worth putting some time aside because it's one of those things that I wouldn't have been aware of at all if you hadn't have introduced me to it. And then these big lumps of relevant activity in history get lost, don't they? So it's yes, yeah, they do. Read the, read the book, people. You need to read the book. Um, so now this has brought us perfect to, without even me realising this had happened, in terms of the French connection, Lord Hastings, his execution, the myth yes. surrounding his execution, and then you told me it happens to be his birthday today. Uh, his ex the day of his execution okay. today. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> That's two very different things, isn't it? Goodness it me. Is. Okay, that was a yeah. So, yeah, so without even realising it, today is his unfortunate anniversary so um and again you know everyone i think has heard this story of his execution and there's lots of well why did that happen it was a bit brutal what had he done you know nobody found out but you have managed to find this connection with france and how that all fits in and it's not necessarily to a certain group of people this massive surprise that it has historically become no um when I was putting the book together, when I was writing the book, I tried, and I was obviously going through each stage, and the one thing that didn't make sense to me was uh, the fact that Hastings was executed. It's very uncharacteristic of Richard. Whatever anybody says about him, one way or another, it's not, it doesn't appear to be in his psyche. So I, I went to look for a reason why it could have possibly happened. So I went back to the beginning of the records, looked at the looked at those records and straight away it becomes clear that Richard has isolated this group of people from the main council it's, it's a detective story so you, you you then ask why was were they isolated away so I then started to look at each of those people that were that in that room to try and identify why they were isolated mm -hmm. and the one thing that came up out of all of them is that Going back to 1475 again, they were all in receipt of French pensions. Right. The French didn't do want do anything for nothing. <laughs> if they were giving you money, they were giving it to you for a reason. Yeah, and they expected. And they expected some form of return at some point or another. Yeah. Um, and Hastings was the one who was getting the most money by a long, long way. Uh, he even refused to, to sign for it, to say that he got it, because he knew what the French were like. And if he didn't do what he was told or didn't do things right, they would have been shouting from the rooftops mm. that Hastings was a French spy, Yeah, which is, which is possibly what it is. Um, so, so therefore, it, it all connects. And I now, the more I look at it, the more I think about it, I think, having any connection to do with the princes in the tower is completely wrong and i'm pretty much certain that the reason hastings was executed was because he was a french spy mm. because people tend to and um, we, we've just spoken about this um people tend to just think that it was all a massive surprise and they just came in took him out chopped his head off and nobody knew why and it was this and it was that but you were saying to me that um thomas stanley had actually warned him that he was literally for the chop and it would probably be yeah. better to just get out quick. Yes, uh, and it's quite possible that Edward knew about his thing because there, there are accounts that talk about during Edward's reign that Hastings was completely out of favour and feared for his life. So there, there is, it's very circumstantial, unfortunately, as most history is. Yeah. <laughs> but but there, there is evidence to support that there is a strong possibility that that he this was then and then when he comes to be executed there is no big outrage anywhere at all mm. because they suspect it and, and also if we go back slightly further only a couple of weeks uh, before all this as well um one of the woodvilles uh found a ship in i think it was southampton harbour i could be wrong um that was loaded with gold and oh, that was coming okay. in that was coming into the country so hmm. was that french payments coming in again yeah. we, we don't know but because you were saying that the amount that hastings received he was he you know it appears that he was in the receipt of the greatest oh huge, huge amount of money 
yeah. 20,000 20, crowns per year. Mm. Which is phenomenal, really. Yes. And, and then yeah. of course, you're sort of you're entering that realm again of um, the nobles, etc., being more powerful than the monarch, which is, of course, a very dangerous situation. Yes. The, uh, yeah. 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 And of course, Morton was another one who was receipt in receipt of quite a large pension off of the French. Um, but because obviously he's a religious person, it's a bit harder to execute him. <laughs> um, so that's when Richard puts him up in with the Duke of Buckingham. Uh, so now, is Buckingham a shady character? Should we look at Buckingham as a very shady character? Or is he kind of like, you know, doing the right thing, even if he's not necessarily going about it in the best way? What do we think of Buckingham? Because people seem to like love him or hate him. Yes, yeah, so he is a bit of a Marmite man. Um, it's hard to tell in reality. <laughs> Sorry, I keep putting <laughs> all these impossible questions. Yeah, I mean, again, there is evidence. We, we've got clear evidence that Buckingham was writing to Henry. Mm, mm. So, so we know that. Is it because Morton's got to him? Uh, and Buckingham does have a slightly more distant claim, but he does have a claim to the throne. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so there's a possibility there. So lots of intrigue that we will never really know. And lots of people can suppose what might have happened and what might have been. But drill down it all, we honestly don't know. Because people have a tendency to, understandably, label monarchs as very sort of suspicious people. But who could you trust? It, it really is. You must have been so conscious of the fact that um, when you were king, particularly, that who could you really trust? Did you really have a friend? Anybody could potentially turn on you, even like your brothers. Oh, yeah. You know, and it must have been a fairly, I always sort of think everybody, not everybody, but lots of people wanted to be king. But it wasn't much fun when you actually got there. No, yeah. Uh, and and trying to kill you. Yeah, and there are spy <laughs> networks from from all sides. Yeah. You're going to have French spies, you're going to have Henry Tudor spies in Richard's court, mm. um, which he clearly does have because mm. of the way things, things move forward. Richard's going to have spies in the French court. He's going to have spies in with Henry. Yeah. That's why he, he Richard does find out quite a lot, mm. although not finely detailed. So Richard clearly got a spy with, within Henry's network. Yeah, it's um, that's it. You just, how would you ever know? No, it, and you, you've just got to look over it. your shoulder the whole time. It doesn't sound like much fun at all to me. Quite no, <laughs> it's just... uh, and, and we've got to we can't forget this doesn't stop with Richard. Henry has exactly the same problems. He's always looking over his shoulder. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Because he he doesn't know. So it's it's a sign of the times. Yes, absolutely. Just what happens. And I think this is one of those things if, when you have this, we, we touched on this just now before we came in. Apparently, there's a tiny, weeny bit of a divide between Richard and Henry. And, and sometimes people get a little bit animated about it. So people often fall into the Richard camp or the Henry camp. And one did good things and one did terrible things. But actually, they were both 100% a product of their time. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, that's obviously, I was being a little bit sarcastic there, but it, it's just that's a context that you need to remember. You can gravitate towards one or the other, absolutely, and have a, I don't like to use the word favourite, but you know what I mean. But yeah. actually, they both were in very stressful situations, pretty much constantly. They both experienced tragedy in terms of loss. Yeah. Um, they both had enormous pressures on them. And in those days, you know, you were surrounded by traitorous people. You didn't know who you could trust. You didn't know what was around the corner, you know, and it was not. And, and you know, if you had to kill someone, you killed them. Of course you did, yes. Yeah. And also we mustn't forget that neither of them, Henry or Richard, would have expected to be king. Mm, yeah. Richard, yeah. of course, being, being the youngest son, that was probably the furthest thing from his family's intentions. Yeah. And he wouldn't have known. And the same with Henry. Yeah. Who would have thought that when Henry was born and as he was growing up, that he would end up being a king as well. So mm. it's it's also interesting to look at those 
the mentalities. It's not like the first son, for example, the Black Prince. Yes. He's brought up to be a soldier and brought up to be king. Yeah. It doesn't not, always happen. Uh, like, like Prince Arthur was. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. There, there was very much that emphasis. And then that's one of history's amazing. What would have happened if Arthur hadn't died? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a whole, a whole different thing. Yeah. But he did. And here we are. And there they were. Um, it's so in terms of talking about sort of treachery and then who could you trust and who you couldn't when it actually came down to it there were some clear factions that um people definitely supported henry or they definitely supported richard and when people look at the battle of bosworth there are the same names that come up so could you tell us, and again, this is quite a broad question and you're probably going to have to isolate out a little bit, but who of the most well-known noble families um, supported Richard and Henry and why did they have those um, allegiances? What tended to, I mean, obviously there was sort of the York-Lancaster division, but there were some people that were a bit of a surprise, actually, that maybe when it came down to it, you'd have thought that they'd have stepped away or some of those who did step away came in and so on and so forth. Big question, sorry. It's all right. <laughs> uh, um, um, yes. Um, what you what I think is the thing as well, to look at look at the bigger picture, um, that the nobility of England at the time was was really interesting mix because all the senior nobles um, were either too old or too young to take part in much fighting. So Richard's supporters, there are some that stay away mm. and don't get involved out, out of the higher echelons of the nobility, but the ones who were of fighting age, uh, I think, take part. The ones, you, you've got lesser nobility who then go to support um, Henry. Mm. Uh, they're, they're, they're very few high placed ones, the only one being, being Oxford. Mm. Uh, and of course, the Stanleys. Mm. Um, the Stanleys are quite, again, it's one of those myths that seems to have appeared um, primarily because of this idea that the Stanleys were between the two armies and they hadn't made their minds up. When in reality, if you look at all the chronicles who talk about it, they were quite clearly supporting Henry from the beginning. But that's unsurprising, being that Margaret Beaufort's married to Thomas Stanley. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and no, no one can expect someone today, husband and wife, to have such a massive secret without being involved in it. And a lot of Thomas Stanley's supporters are also Margaret's, and Margaret's using them to communicate with Henry over in France and Brittany. So it, it, they can't be there. So, so they're actually there. And all the things that, that happened subsequently and if you look at all the chronicles, they're quite clearly there from the start. Mm. So, so they're they're quite a key one in all of this. Um, and, and another one, of course, is when Richard's up in Nottingham just before he comes down to fight the battle. Uh, he does openly declare William Stanley a traitor. Yeah. So again, doesn't help. You know, we, no, <laughs> no. But we, so this idea that they're that they're sitting in the, on the fence. And they haven't made their minds up and waiting to see how the battle goes it is complete rubbish. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, and also, and it's, so a lot of Henry's supporters are Welsh uh, yeah. as, as they come along. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest ones being Resap Thomas, of course, of being one of the important Welsh ones. However, if you read all the accounts of the Battle of Bosworth, he's in at least two places at the same time. This is very so, simple. It is. So, <laughs> so I, I, I think he's played up a bit. Right, of, of okay. Battle. He's been given a bit of celebrity status. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So he's another, he's another quite key player, but he, he's not a huge player. Okay. Um, Oxford again, of course. Yeah. Um, again, he's important, but you sort of get the impression from reading a lot of the Tudor sources that he's one of the um, the, the key people. He uh, he. If if you look at look at the accounts, particularly Virgil's account, Virgil's first account, his first manuscript, um, actually puts 
puts him in charge of just the front line, the, the battle line, not the whole army. Okay. Um, who I actually think is the one that's that's in charge of the army um, is Philippe de Chandé, who is the commander of the French. Oh, wow. Which, okay. which is why straight after the battle, Henry makes him uh, the Earl of Bath. Yeah, interesting. Uh, uh, and 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 commanding them, and of course the French as well. Those two thousand French professional soldiers make such a huge difference, uh, and they're the battle winners. But they, they, well, they are the difference, really, aren't they? Oh yes, yeah. yeah sure. and, and they're fighting a different style to the Eng to the to Richard's English. Um, it's a surprise attack on Richard's flank, so Richard really couldn't do anything about it. Um, do you think, one really quick question, and then I'll come back to this question about Richard. As a contemporary source, how reliable do you believe Virgil to be? 70%. Oh, okay. It, but, but what you've got to do is to look at each version. Okay. Because he, he wrote four versions. Oh, Why do these people never do things in a straightforward fashion? For exactly. 500 years later, it's very inconsiderate. Yeah, so, so you have to look at the first version yes, yes. and which bits are added in and which bits are scrubbed out. Yeah. Uh, and then, so over time, you tend to get a more sanitised version. Yes, the more Henry-friendly version. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, right, so I just, I just, that's popped into my head then. Um, this is something that I've wondered in the past. Um, so going back to Richard, how there's all these accounts of you know how he must have felt the night before the battle i mean not great clearly no one's going to feel great the night before are they but how concerned do you think he was because technically speaking he was in the stronger position in terms of the troops and their experience around him and also himself he was well known for being um, extremely adept on the battlefield compared to henry of course who wasn't <laughs> <laughs> so you know it, it, I know again I'm asking you how do you think somebody felt and that is impossible to know but you know you get the accounts that suggest he was really unsettled in fact I, I think that's all written later okay um, I think at the time I, I, if I was a military commander I would have been going into that battle confident mm. I can't say how, how Richard would have thought um, but I know I would have gone in there. I've got superior numbers. I've got a large amount of artillery. Um, okay, what, what we don't have, bearing in mind that Richard doesn't know about the French or, or knows very little about the French yeah. at this point. So against Henry Tudor's invading army, I think he would have been fairly comfortable with the fact that, that he would win the battle. Yeah, I would have thought so, personally. Um, um. So conversely, how terrified do you think Henry might have been? I, I think he was. Yeah, I, I think he was. He was. He was very worried. Yeah. Um, I would have been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he, he's obviously got the again. We're going back to the French, but he's got the French, so he knows that they're they're, they're a battle winner on their own. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so they're there, but he, I don't think he understands the military tactics of the time mm. uh, and when we get this comment in Virgil about how Henry um, wasn't happy with the Stanleys going off uh, again that's been interpreted about this not making minds up right yeah but what, but what I, I think it is is that they don't Henry doesn't understand what the tactics are Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And, and how it's going to work. Yeah. Because we, we, we have to remember that the standings are on the battlefield or in the area of the battlefield uh, three days before the, before the battle. So even before Henry arrives. Mm. Yeah. So they've chosen the battlefield. Yeah. They've chosen it for a particular reason, mm. which, which is the marsh mm -hmm. and controlling the high ground. And the edge of the battlefield is in woods, so you can hide... Yeah. troops when you need to so I think a lot of it is down to that and I, and I just think that, that Henry doesn't understand um, we know that straight afterwards uh, Henry starts pushing out um, Vegetius um, manual of, of warfare which is an old Roman one 
and he starts sending it out straight afterwards and telling everybody you have to read this this is how this is how to do it right so he so, those gaps yeah in his yeah. knowledge definitely yeah yeah I uh, and one sorry sorry uh, one of the big things with it is is flank attacks uh and i think he uses this at stoke later on mm. um and again with the um the cornish revolt um he puts that down in the same way as well yeah so he'd obviously spent a considerable amount of time thinking this happened maybe thinking i got a bit lucky there so yeah. <laughs> i make sure next time that it's judgment and not luck yeah let's get the book out and teach people how to do it i wonder if um it's a path he would have ever imagined or have chosen for himself at what point other people go you know you should have a go at this obviously yeah not those exact words and he actually was going oh yeah i don't really think so and obviously at some point he went yeah okay and i wonder how far back that point was and how how much was it was other people sort of pushing him until he got into that mindset yeah i i i think that very probably that it wasn't very long because again he he was in the shadow of, of jasper the whole time mm particularly yeah. to start with it isn't till later on where obviously people are talking to him people like morton and all these people saying yeah you should go for king yeah uh, and his attitudes start to change slightly you see i can't help it i like jasper <laughs> yeah, jasper, yeah. jasper's my random tudor crush <laughs> 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 so um yeah i've read i've read some good summer but yeah i know that's a bit random it doesn't make much sense really um, but everyone has their sort of random like person they'd be like oh quite like them if i was around then they'd have been my like person he, he's so, very clearly a clever man yes uh, and very and very knowledgeable and experienced man yeah. um, um, but that's another whole story this could yes and we, and we also mustn't forget that his mother is actually french Yes, which then which then gives us a, a another connection and another French connection yeah. to the whole story, which is endless. You know, it, it is. It's so hard because obviously we study, especially when you first introduce people to history at school or whatever. It's very much a little pocket, isn't it? Yeah. And um, for people to then expand on that is is quite difficult for. I think one of the things with the Tudors that certainly I experienced, and I know everybody, as you know, lots of people have said the same thing, is that people tend to get drawn to the Tudors with the story of Henry VIII or maybe yes. Elizabeth. And then with Henry, it tends to start with Anne Boleyn. So you've got that very clear link there between Henry Anne and Elizabeth, haven't you? Yeah. And, and then it kind of filters out round from that, you know, Mary a bit, Edward a bit, Jane Grey might as well not exist. Um, poor yeah. thing. But Henry, I feel, gets a bit lost because you've got Henry the Eighth, yeah, and then of course you've got Richard, and both Henry Eighth and Richard the Third are big, big, big characters in in different ways. Yeah, and um, you know, and their their stories have been massively focused on. So poor old Henry Tudor has kind of got a bit swept away. Yes, and um, but that's my my end of the Tudors and the histories is more that period. That's the bit I like the most. Yeah. For, for whether, whether you, you loathe or love Henry, uh, one thing that can't be argued, and, and it's often overlooked, um, is how he broke the power of the barons. Mm, absolutely. Which is, which is something that nobody could do before then. Yeah. That, and that's a big, big, big thing that really affected how things were in England, you know, the, the sort of the stopping of the crown being passed across over the battlefield and all these things oh, exactly. like that. And it did make, as you say, whether you love him or you loathe it, that made a monumental difference to the place that England became. Yes. And I sometimes feel like, I'm sorry people have heard me say this before, but people say, oh, the medieval period and then the Tudor period. So obviously it begins with Henry the Seventh. And yes, technically it does, 
But I feel really, to me, the medieval period extends through his reign. And it's not until you get to Henry VIII and his like Renaissance prince and his eight million wives and his, you know, flouncing about and being all sporty and flamboyant in the field of cloth of gold, etc., etc., etc. To me, that feels like more of a marker for change. Yes. Yeah. And um, I mean... Uh, and it, it's like the, the, the perennial question of when did the renaissance start yeah because things have started happening in richard's time and and they went back and then came back again yeah and and that all again gets lost doesn't it in, in all the sort of stuff that happens in the interim it's all yes yeah, yeah. We could just talk R about richard was very much for books and importing books with lots of new ideas yeah uh, and henry stops them so you know it's it's you, you take it as it comes along you see i i'm uh, that rare breed where i like both of them yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, i'm either i'm sort of a sort of a tudor ricardian if you like that yeah that's such a thing yes. <laughs> or, or <the laughs> tudor, whichever way you want to put it really you're striding <laughs> both camps yes I'm, I'm sort of sitting on the fence for fear yeah. <laughs> of not upsetting anybody so and I, I suppose really my my first love is the Tudors I, I was explaining to Mike before we started about how I sort of moved into this period and that's another another story um but I think with the Tudors it's the flamboyance and it's the you simply couldn't make it up no you know you you, you just couldn't it's it's just that the six wives and you know and all that sort of thing it's just wow it really is something that's quite phenomenal and so it draws you to that and the yeah. opulence and you know all these types of things you know with the the, the the activities at the court and the dances and the sports and and the dresses and the and it is just a gradual sort of development from what came before but you you watch these things and, and i know yeah. the documentaries but it's very ta-da yes whereas other stuff is a little bit more dingy and not quite yeah. the same when candle you... candlelight and single candles in a big room and yeah like in wolf hall yes you know yeah. and, and you definitely see and i've heard a few people say that they found it but harder almost to watch Wolf Hall because it wasn't so brilliantly lit and mm. singing and all dancing and, and very it was much more you know reality is not quite the right word but that that kind of feel to do it was a lot more sort of gritty and, and real and, yeah you know yeah. so oh god well, I could talk about this <laughs> day. but you will be back won't you this is this I will. Yes. the only time of, of several times that we are going to be speaking with you over the next however many times mm -hmm. so um yeah there's definitely lots of areas we could focus on maybe including jasper actually because as you say very key player but a little bit sort of shadowy and in yes. the background you know yeah. bearing in mind the role that he did play is, is a little bit of a shame in a way yeah yeah so, and you know people don't tend to hear about his marriage and his daughter and daughters and all that type of thing and they're, they're all sort of, sort of into oblivion aren't they? yeah they are yes it's a bit of a shame and then there's all these um him and margaret had a bit of a secret love tryst going on and all this type of thing yeah oh there, there are <laughs> so many things that go on yeah one thing I will just sort of say on this, just to, fit, to round off the French connection story, is that once Henry was on the throne, the French were writing lots of poems um, and, and accounts saying how ungrateful Henry was because they put him on the throne. Oh, okay. Oh, dear. Uh, so it, it just finishes off the story about how important the whole of the European thing is and why you have to read the book, because we've got no chance of telling you the story. Uh, in a short conversation. Absolutely. Today. This is the thing, isn't it? I was sort of throwing some questions at you, and they're so broad, and it's like trying to split it down into these tiny little bite sized things is really hard. But it gives us lots of food for thought. Yes. For subsequent get togethers, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah, we can do lots more. We certainly can, because there is, there's just so much. 
so um i will put in some links and bits and pieces to your social media and your books and so on and so forth um i did put up a link to the book the other day the the, the book on richard the third and the battle of bosworth so that is really quite essential reading at this point and before it was written as well actually we should have done this several years ago <laughs> however um right so thank you so so much for coming along today it's been amazing i i my pleasure I love this and I could talk to you about it all day for weeks on end. However, I will let you get back to all the things you need to do. <laughs> Thank you very I much. Speak to you soon. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.